I've had so many ha aha moments, even now as I've gotten older here in Boston. I mean, when I first started broadcasting, one of them came when I was um, my first couple of years. And, you know, as a, as a radio analyst, the first, it's, it's one of the hardest jobs you can have. Oh, yeah. You got to lay out all the time. <laughs> you got to you got to know when to get in. You got to have these smart lines. I always tell people, I say, you want to be a great analyst? I said, take a play and say something smart and articulate and funny in a five-second burst. That's right. And, and say that every every minute, you know, you come out. That's all you have. That's all you got between <laughs> five and ten seconds. That's all you have. Figure well, out how to do that. Started, That's right. For me, being being here, I was, you know, slower tongue and, and you know, and it's trying to fit your way in because it is such a tough job. Um, and then there was a black guy who was critical of me. And, and I really wasn't that good. I was learning. And like anybody has to learn their craft. And uh, the thing that he said to me, he wrote, well, he didn't say it to me, but he wrote it in the paper. He said that I was the pool professor, not the professor. He said I was the pool professor of Ebonics. And this was a black man. And I remember meeting him. His name was Howard Manley. I will always remember his name. Meeting him out someplace, he walks up to me, says, uh, hey, and you know, I'm always shaking anybody's hand. He walks up, he sticks his hand out, I stick mine out, he said, I'm Howard Manley. He said that, I immediately pulled my hand back <laughs> and walked away. I didn't understand, first of all, how an editor could let that go out in a paper during okay. this Okay, yeah, it yeah. Just, it just baffled my mind that you could, that the editor would allow somebody to say that about anybody in a newspaper. And so there were some moments as a, as a broadcaster that, that, like I said, I've, I've learned, and, you know, now every phrase you can shoot anything. And, yes. You know, you do your thing now and it, it, when you've been around, you know, you know how to get in, you know the nuance, and you could work with essentially anybody because you That's find right. your pitches, you know what you have to say in a small burst, but it was so fascinating to me to have that black man tear down, tear me down with something I thought was like one of the most vile things that you could say. You could say I wasn't good. Yeah. But for him to go out, it's almost like you're attacking your own race when you say he's the, the professor of Ebonics, which to me, even today, still pisses me off when I think about it. But you know, you talk about attacking your own race, and, and, and that's a great statement. I remember a long time ago, Max, I'm not going to call this guy's name, uh, but he was a player in the league, and he talked about his financial advisor. Well, why can't you talk about his name? Why can't you give me Well, because I, I, I wouldn't want to say that about somebody. I, I don't, you know, I, he just, but he said, I got a white financial advisor because black people don't know nothing about money. And he was, that's, that's, that's kind of bad for him to say. He talking about himself. Yeah. Talking about himself and his money. <laughs> and I thought he, 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 didn't even, he didn't even hear what he was saying. And there, there's been a long time where, where black people didn't really like black people because the people that we saw weren't the people that we thought we wanted to be. And because the, 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 the presentation of who we are and who we can be has not been that uh, encompassing. Like I know there are probably many people who are listening to your podcast don't know who Robert Smith is. But Robert Smith, the richest black man in America, he don't shoot no ball, he don't kick no ball, he don't hit no ball. He worth about five billion dollars and uh, two weeks ago he said he's starting a fund to raise $500 million so that the top 5,000 black students at HBCUs, he gonna pay their tuition. Wow, that is that. Those are things to me, Gil, which are so good. And how did we, and, and, and I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna go kind of closing here, but how did we get past that point when we were young to where we are now? I know it's experience. But one of the things that people said during that time when we were coming up, and I can still hear my grandparents say it, and it's cruel as it can be, but they always said, don't trust them niggas. 
That was that was a black line talking about black people. Say if it was an insurance person coming around, or you, you can't trust them niggas. And that to me was was powerful. And even today, I, I mean, I know you heard it, and it it, it 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 just like it's like a bolt of lightning when you think about it now, as you're saying about some guy who had a white financial advisor. Well, white people steal from from you just as quick, or or. It might not be as brilliant as that other guy, but you were trained at that time early well, on. Listen, Matt, if their last name is Madoff, they do a real good job. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Madoff, yes. So, so here's the deal. You, you, you said a great phrase. You said grandparents. See, my grandmother, her name was Estelle Coley. Estelle Coley said she's the reason I am who I am. She's been deceased a long time. And when I lived in Pikeville, North Carolina, my grandfather was a sharecropper. He, 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 he grew tobacco on the land, but he didn't own the land. And, and we would put it in the tobacco and he would sell the crops and, and then he'd have to pay two thirds. He, he made one third of the profit and he paid two thirds of, of all of the expenses. And so he ended up uh, broke after, after every season. Which, which, he, he, which was... Which was uh, slavery, which yeah, was yeah, because then he had because you had to eat during the winter, so you could got you got to go to the store and buy your food and your sustenance, and then you had to pay that money off when you put in the tobacco, and and so you you brought all you did was break even, but my grandmother told me I was as good as anybody, not better, but I was as good as anybody. And of all the things that she told me about myself, the one thing she forgot to tell me is that we were poor. I never felt poor because of the way she could bake a blueberry pie. We call it huckleberry pie. Or the way she would, would stew fry the corn or the way she would make the cabbage casserole. And then my grandfather had the cured ham out in the smokehouse. And she showed me love and support and understanding. And I remember going to church in Kinston, North Carolina. Mm. And, and not going to the church, but going out on the playground and playing basketball with the boys around there because everybody wanted to support me and tell me that I could make it and that I was okay. And what we, when you talk about that teen part, what the people who want to oppress part of the population don't understand, that if you supported that part of the population, if you put that part of the population in a position to excel and to excel and do well everybody excels and does well you know the, the 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 lowest tide lifts all the boats and that's what people don't understand they are so afraid that the pie is finite and that if you get a piece of the pie they're not going to get a piece of the pie instead of figuring out how to get more ingredients and making a damn bigger pie 